Golf of Women. Yeah? I love him. I know the question he's asking is, do women love God? Am I the only one? But tonight's lesson title is, does God love women? And most of us would say, yeah, for sure. But when we go share our faith, there's a different story with the world and how people view God and view the Bible. Have you ever shared your faith and someone say to you, the Bible is sexist and it's oppressive to women. I don't want to follow a God that is sexist and oppressive. Yeah. And there's so many scriptures in the Bible. There's one scripture that says women can't even speak. And we just have to be submissive to men. It's not fair. So what are some things you would say really briefly, quick, on the top of your head, if someone said that to you, I'd show your face. What are some things you say? Great. In the back. Selena. It's taken out of context. Excellent. I'm so bad when it comes. Janelle. Yes. Thank you. The longest conversation. That's good. I like that. It's kind of funny. <laughs> All right. Um, Victoria. First time to the soul of women in the and in those days, you could add the testimony of women with nada. So you know, you, women were not even allowed to testify in court. Yet Jesus comes and, sh- and resurrects to a woman. Next girl, uh, is it Pahela next to you? You asked her to study the Bible. Last one, the end. I didn't want them who was able to persuade the majority of the Testament. I love that. That's a good one. Exactly. She had superpowers. Okay, that's excellent, guys. You are on it. Okay, so Christianity is, most people believe that Christianity is not only outdated, but the Bible is to blame for patriarchal oppression. Well, I want to give you three arguments before I get into the main text of my lesson. Uh, three arguments to help you, two, three, uh, three arguments to help you refute what people say. Number one. Okay, the equality of the sexes is a biblical ideology, okay? The equality of the sexes is actually an ideology that is from God. So if you're sharing with atheists, remind them that according to what they believe, human beings have no intrinsic value since our lives are simply evolutionary accidents, okay? So oftentimes put the onus back on the person, So a lot of times people will give you a moral uh, argument against God, but they don't have a moral foundation uh, and they're uh, anti-religion. So where are you getting your morals from? If you're not getting your morals from the Bible, who's to say and why should we have equality for women? What's the big deal with equality? Who cares? It's survival of the fittest. So, amen, I'm going to be the toughest woman I can, and I'm going to go to the top, and that's how I'm going to live my life, right? That's how, that's the argument. But, but, okay, so, okay, so now you're saying, it's not survival of the fittest, I need to go, it's fine, okay, women have an equal right, so let me figure this out. So, okay, we're going to ditch evolution, but now we're, bringing in, we're going to bring in morality. That doesn't play with what your belief system is. So if you want to do morality, let's do morality and let's do what Mahela just said, let's study the Bible. Come on, right? Amen. Number two, the God of the Bible isn't sexist, but people are. Sorry, we all are sinners. It's so important to understand that the Bible, especially the OT, is an ancient record detailing both the highs and the extreme lows. We've seen some really ugly stuff of human behavior. And sadly, there are accounts in the Bible of rape, polygamy, incest, and other forms of female oppression. So what's great is the Bible relates to the human condition. God doesn't take those things out and make this this pious book that no bad stuff happened. It's super relatable. And we need to remind our friends that the purpose of these records is not to commend, but to condemn sexist and sinful behavior. Not only sexism, we're talking sin. Abuse against children, abuse against men. Okay, the key to making sense of challenging passages, guys, is to recognize 
Well, ask yourself this. When is the text being prescriptive? Write that down. Prescriptive. Well, prescription does what? It gives you instructions, okay? Is this a prescriptive or is this a descriptive? Yes. I.e., is it just reporting what happened? God may have allowed inequality or an abusive situation in some of the Bible stories that we read, but it doesn't mean he willed it. Right. It's not a prescription for sin. It's a description. Amen? So as one writer puts it, the Old Testament law was created to guide a post-fall society that already, because the law didn't come until after uh, Adam and Eve and sin and with the fallen creatures that we are. So post-fall society that already included female inequality, divorce, and polygamy. Yeah. Okay, these were already going on. So God created laws after the fact, within a fallen context. Okay, ideally, he would just say, hey, guys, stop sinning. Right? That would really be the prescription. Yeah. Just stop sinning. But we don't. Yeah. We don't. So he's like giving us all of these laws. And we still disobey them. Yeah. The thing is, God gives us free will. Yeah. So at the end of the day, we're stuck with that free will. Yeah. And as Christians, we have to go, yep, yeah, that happened in the church. Yes, that happens in Christianity. Yeah. Yes, that happened in my life because I'm a sinner. We're not perfect. So, so okay, I'll give you a quick example. I love this. I, was, I, I got so into this uh, little, little study here. It's really good. So there are places in the scripture that texts have seemed very strange and there are some laws that were like that just totally doesn't make sense but when you take in is it descriptive or is it prescriptive and also you take in the cultural norms at the time what seem initially oppressive or even abusive laws towards women were actually put in place for our protection so check this out a quick example You can turn there if you have your Bibles, if you want, in Deuteronomy 21, 10 to 14. There is a law that allows an Israelite man who is in war to seize a captured woman, an enemy woman. If he sees a beautiful woman who's the enemy, he is allowed to seize her and bring her back to Israel and claim her as his wife. Now, on the surface, that is terrible. How much? Are you kidding me? Okay, what we really need to understand is the historical context of this. So when, when historians have done, done archaeology and seen different things, they have found that in war at those times, people were barbaric. Barbarians. Okay. Not only were women raped, villages pillaged, and killed, children killed at the will of whatever, um, whatever admiral or whatever captain, army captain was, you know the right words, I'm not a normal person. But yeah, those bad guys, they're going into the war, right? They raped and pillaged and burned down villages. Um, but there are no, but the, it, the, there are, they've never found any archaeological evidence that Israel raped and pillaged. They were commanded by God to burn down villages that were enemy wide so that they could not ever come back and taint Israel. Amen. That's different. But there was none. So, so many of the men obeyed this law. But what's really beautiful about this, if you read this passage, it says in verse 14, take a home, clean her up, right? Take a home, clean her up. Now, verse 14, but if you no longer delight in her, you shall let her go before she wants. But you shall not sell her for money. Don't treat her like a slave, nor shall you treat her like a slave, since you have humiliated her. Okay, so, but God says, bring her back, clean her up, cut her now. It's crazy. It's really, really explicit information. And then he says, don't have sex with her. Don't touch this woman out of dignity, to give her a month to grieve her family, okay? And then you can make her, you can't just sleep with her. You can't just rape her. You can't just whatever. You now need to make her your wife. And she now becomes part of the Israelite community and then up with privileges just like everybody else. This is actually a protective law. But you've got to look at it with eyes 
of history and context. It's so important. A whole month. That's the God. That is very compassionate. Now, I know it sounds like, well, he shouldn't have even taken her. Amen. Again, we're in a barbaric time. It's a very different. Life was cheap. And actually, in some cultures, it's still cheap. Right? Yeah, one of us, we, we understand. So what we see as first world privileges are not even still to this day in some Arab countries yeah. as well. Amen? So that's just one. But you can go through the whole Bible and... Um, and see that these laws are actually in the, on the surface from a first century, 21st century woman, a little odd. But at the end of the day, they're, very, they're there to protect women. Wow. Okay. Wow. All right. The Bible, the God of the Bible isn't sexist, but people in the Bible were. Amen. Okay. Historic, we talked about historical context. Okay. Number three, Jesus sets the standard for how women should be treated. Jesus was extraordinarily countercultural, and we all know this in his treatment of women. Okay? At the time that Jesus was born in the ancient world, women were seen as second-class citizens. Yeah. Education of women was nearly naught, or at, at the least was very limited, and often they were confined just to domestic duties, often. They weren't, as I said earlier, even allowed to testify in court. In promiscuity was blamed not on the man, but on the woman. And that is why the adulterous woman was brought and not the adulterous man. Yeah. It was thought that women caused men to sin wow. in his day. But Jesus challenges that when he says uh, that every, that, that uh, he turns that upside down when he says that anyone who even looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So by demanding that his hearers take responsibility for their own lust, Jesus calls them to a higher standard of seeing women not as sexual objects, but as human beings equally made in the image of God. This was beyond, beyond the cultural time. It's even beyond our cultural time. Come on, give me a break. Are women uh, sexualized? Yes, we sure are. He challenged gender roles by including them in his company as students, teachers, reliable witnesses, as one sister said, and leaders. Christ honored the Samaritan woman, right? John fought the well. The Syrophoenician woman, Syrophoenician woman, considered a dog by her norm. He raised her up and spoke to her. The bleeding woman, excluded from the temple, touched Jesus and was healed. The woman caught in adultery. We just talked about that. He he shamed those that wanted to stone her, and everyone walked away. They couldn't stone her. It is most evident how Jesus treated women in the section in Luke, which we'll study out tonight, where Christ made visible the woman's dignity and value. This section, which we can turn to now, is in Luke 7 and Luke 8. And uh, my mother in the faith, Elena McKean, actually uh, coined this section, the women's elevation section. And in uh, 2014, she was asked as the professor and dean of women of ICCM Global, to speak to the students of the 2014 class about this section, to the sisters, actually, just to the sisters. And she taught them. And as she said, as she studied and prayed over this section, it dawned on her the number of powerful interactions Jesus had with women. She shared this discovery with Kip, and they decided to brace these passages, as I said, as the women's elevation section. And this became the seed for her extraordinary book, which I hope most of you have read, called Elevate. And it shares how Jesus elevates women. And we're going to pick it up in chapter 7 and verse 11. My first point of this section is don't cry. When hope, hope, excuse me, hope when there is no hope. And really, this section reminds me a lot about what Alicia shared tonight. In verse 11, soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. 
and a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bier. They were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. Amen. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Wow. Here we see that this is obviously, right, it says soon afterwards, soon afterwards what? Right before this, Jesus feels heals the, the, the centurion son, the centurion um, servant. And he's got a large crowd with him. So we see here at the contrast of two crowds, one rejoicing after an incredible miracle and another crowd who are mourning for the loss of this poor widow's son. What's beautiful is, to, is that no matter where we're at, you know, some, Jesus is not inconvenienced by our pain. He's not inconvenienced. He could have easily, and I, I was thinking about it myself, like when I'm on a roll or I'm, on, or I'm really happy or high or I'm just like celebrating something, like if it's your birthday, it's like, oh man, I don't want to be a dad. Like I don't, when someone's sad, I'm like, oh, I don't really want to notice that person right now because I want to have some fun. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, Oh, I can't hear a party. <laughs> and my party is Campus Devo, okay? Just in case you're wondering. Oh, that's my party. I came to a party and that sister was like giving me that look. <laughs> like, can we talk? <laughs> Have you been there? Have you been there? Or you just want to relax, put your feet up, and the phone rings. And you're like, oh, no, I don't know what that's about. <laughs> Jesus, real. Jesus, he's not like me. Not like me. I'm a sinner, bigger sinner than you guys. He's not like Michelle. He's so rich. He stops. Amen. And the first thing he says, which is so beautiful, don't cry. Don't cry. Amen. He hears us when we're sad. He doesn't want us to cry. Why? Maybe he don't want to take maybe she maybe he won't raise the yeah. son. Maybe yeah. he won't change his circumstances. Yeah. But I think Alicia really spelled it out tonight. Yeah. We don't need to cry because we have hope. Yes. A hope that is everlasting and eternal yeah. and kept in heaven for us. Yeah. yeah. We don't need to cry. And it says that his heart went out to her. He got almost stopped everything. His heart went out to her. And this concept is the word compassion, which in Greek is splagina, which is not a very nice word, actually. It sounds like slag. Splagina. Oh, I didn't have to say that, sorry. <laughs> it means his insides were torn apart. Like Jesus felt her pain. He felt her pain in his stomach. Have you ever heard of like a gruesome story? A lot of blood. Um, and you're, you just go, man, I feel sick. That's your, that's compassion yeah. working. That's your heart going out to the situation going, oh, that's awful. Wow. That's how Jesus felt. And it wasn't blood and guts, but it was just this woman and son that died. And she was a woman. And in that time, because women were treated like trash and didn't have um, benevolence and they didn't have benefits, she was going to be done with the work. Yeah. She would have probably had to just be like the other widow at the temple, and just stay there day and night and serve and hope to get bread once a day. Wow. And probably sleep within the temple courts. You know? But Jesus stopped everything. She was a nobody. Wow. She was a nobody. Wow. Hope when there is no hope. That is Jesus. There was no great faith. There were no great deeds and there were no mighty prayers. 
like we see in so many of the other healings Jesus did for people. There was only tears. So if you feel like you're a nobody and God, you haven't done enough for God this week and you just want to cry, cry. Because that's enough for Jesus to stop and listen. You don't have to be perfect. Jesus could have easily, as I said, walked away. Our hope comes from who Jesus is, not who we are and what we have done. Amen. Amen. And I just want to talk about the dead man for a second. I think it's really powerful, the dead dead son. Do you feel sometimes like your faith might be dead? You might not be the woman. You might be the guy with the beard. You're dead. You feel dead inside. Yeah, you're dull. You're dead. There's no. You wish you could even have something like what Alicia just shared tonight. Like, man, if that happened to me, I'd have fallen away. That's how dead I am. You know what I mean? And I think you've got to, you know, what did Jesus do? He touched the beard. He touched that deadness. And again, I, I don't know, I didn't look this up, but maybe it was wrong for people to touch dead bodies that would have been unclean. Oh, yeah. It was blood. I'm sure dead, right? Yeah. He touched the uncleanest part wow. of that whole story. And that's the part he wants to touch in you. But you've got to let him get in there. Wow, come on. Let him touch the dead area of your life. And that takes vulnerability. Yeah. And that takes even you coming out of possible self-denial. Because sometimes we don't even want to go to certain places in our heart because it's not only embarrassing, but it's painful to admit the truth. And I think for Jesus to touch the dead areas, we've got to admit the ugly truth and let him in to that ugly truth and heal that ugly truth and restore the joy of your salvation and bring you back to life. So sisters, Jesus is saying, don't cry, but he's also saying, get up. Mm -hmm. Young man, young woman, old woman, I say to you, get up. He wants to elevate you. Will you let him? Amen. Amen. My second point is in Luke 7, 36, right, uh, right to next paragraph, two paragraphs down. Luke 7, 36 to 50. And it, the second point is, do you see this woman? Question mark. I do. God sees me. In verse 36 now, we'll pick it up there. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with her alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who's touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, because obviously he didn't think Jesus could read his mind. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, "Mm, You got me there. (laughs) No, he says, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. (laughs) Probably begrudgingly, because he was convicted. Jesus says, You have judged correctly. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? Simon, do you see this woman? No, Simon. Do you really see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she 
wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped <coughs> kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins are forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven a little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say amongst themselves, who is this that even forgives sin? But Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And you know she left in peace. The other guests too, I'm sure Jesus would say, do you see this woman? Yeah. They all focused on Jesus and the Lord. And how can you do this? The simple act of worship they had lost. And this is another incredible um, contrast. We saw the contrast of two groups, one celebrating a healing and one grieving a death. And we see the contrast here of two types of sinners. One who saw her sin and one who didn't. We see the contrast of a man and a woman. And we see the contrast here of two types of worship. Wow. You know, we have Simon. And he was probably a religiously perfect Pharisee. He probably saw him as a great Pharisee and probably had a lot of Pharisees around him. He was like, I'm going to die in this Jesus guy in my house. Come along and see. It was probably more of a circus act for him that he wanted Jesus just to kind of perform for his son. And he didn't even offer him. Wow. Eastern culture at that time, he had probably servants that could have washed Jesus' feet. He wow. didn't even offer him. Basic hospitality. Wow. Simon kept Jesus at a distance. Wow. Surely Matthew 15, 8 is true of Simon. Simon honoured Jesus with his look. Wow. But his heart was far from him. And if Jesus called out not only his heart, but his actions revealed his heart. Wow. He did nothing for Jesus. Wow. And the Bible says that his worship was in vain, therefore. Wow. But this sinful woman offers us a beautiful picture of true worship. She understood who Jesus was. She poured out everything she had. In fact, some say that she was probably a prostitute because it says she had like a very sinful life and many people in town knew it. And in those days, I'm sure the perfume when she was a prostitute was used to elicit customers. But now she gives her life and everything she has that she used for the past now to give to Jesus and anoint him and worship him at his feet. Her worship had no bounds. It was deeply vulnerable and probably very strange to those watching. For a woman to have her head down in that cult in those times was considered lewd, was considered, oh wow, she's acting like a prostitute. You're showing too much of yourself. Your hair was part of your physical body. And in many cultures, we have head coverings because they see hair as a sensual part of a woman. Yet, Jesus, but you see the purity of Jesus. Women could come with their hair undone, naked even. I say that just for you. Yeah. He, he sees us as we are. He sees us as what? Well. And he's safe. I remember growing up in a very, very unsafe childhood, in a very unsafe childhood home. And I remember a, a, a year or so into my Christianity, I would get up very, very early in the morning and I would cry a lot because I would just feel like I had so much that needed to be healed. Yeah. And I remember one day, after coming out of prayer and just crying and worshiping God, I just remember going, oh my goodness, God is so pure. He's pure. You don't need to be afraid of him. He's pure. I have never been around a man that was so pure. Come on. And it was just like, bang, my, my, my worship went to a new height. Wow. Because he became so, so safe. Come on. Jesus is so pure. And we'll even talk about that a little later, about how, just how incredible that is yes. to be around him as a woman. Like, how liberating was that? 
for these women. Sisters, I'm asking tonight, how do you express your love and your devotion and thankfulness to Christ? Wow. Are you thankful? Are you still in love with Jesus for his costly sacrifice of dying on the cross for you? Is that enough? Wow. It's enough for Elisha. Evidently, yeah. it's all she Come on. When Jesus is all you need, it's all you need. <laughs> it's awesome. You're rich. You're rich. Another interesting thing is Luke 7 47. The Bible says, Her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown, but whoever has been forgiven little loves little. So if your love for God is little right now, do a sin list. Get in touch with who you were before you were a Christian. Remember that girl. Just remember what he saved you from. Why, how could you do such an expensive and humbling thing? There is only one plausible answer. Forgiveness. Yeah. Forgiveness. The power of forgiveness. <clears throat> and sisters, when you grasp how much you need forgiveness, and when you reach out and receive it, your life changes forever. Amen. And isn't that what we try to teach people when we the Bible? Yeah. You need to be forgiven. Yeah. Every human being on this earth needs to be forgiven because all have sinned yeah. and all fall short of the glory of God. Right. This woman experienced firsthand that Jesus values women. And not only that, but simple women. Simple women that the whole world is saying, no, she's really simple. You don't want to help her. She's like a lost cause. Do you feel like a lot of lost cause? Reread this passage and get hope. You are not a lost cause. <laughs> and as I said, Simon only saw the outer. Jesus saw her inner. He saw past her past. Amen? He saw her potential, her value as a woman. And a woman forgiven and redeemed? Wow. What can a woman do when she's forgiven and redeemed? Right? We look at all of these women in the Bible as examples of women of faith. Women that have been forgiven, that have done so much. We've got many of you guys here in this church. We've got me throughout Europe and throughout the world. Her value as a woman, forgiven and redeemed, and the value of us as women that have been forgiven and redeemed can change the world. I just want to make a note here before I forget. I, I was when I did this lesson, some of this lesson on ICC on Saturday. I was reading through my notes, and I was like, a woman forgiven and redeemed that changed the world. John 4, the woman at the well. She changed her whole village. She changed her whole village. I was thinking that, and I was like, wait a second. This is a nugget of nuggets, God. <laughs> no, even Paul Bustari was like, <laughs> he was like, you're my favorite teacher. <laughs> Nugget, nugget. <laughs> so, Jesus is at the well. He's talking to the woman. His disciples go and get food in the village, her village. Come back. Was the village evangelist? Do we hear any news? No. We did not hear a thing. The apostles of Christ went into a village. Nothing changed. That woman. Dropped her water jar. He told me everything. Everything that they've done. The village was transformed. Many in the village came out. Who is this Jesus? And the Bible says that many believe because of the woman's testimony. Get up. <laughs> yes. What? Right? My mind, the ICCM class, the brothers were like, What? A woman, another sinful woman, down and out, trashed. Like when you're at rock bottom, that's actually when God can do the best work in your life. Rock bottom. 
Father. Six different relationships. Yeah. That's awesome. Alone. Zero friends. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Apostles. Wow. Walking with Jesus. Wow. Participating wow. in his miracles. Explode and learn. This woman. What can we not do when we understand how much we've been forgiven of? When we understand Jesus sees us. Amen. Get in touch with that. You will not only change your life, your family, but you will change your village. This is so powerful. Don't let anyone, not even your own mind, which is worldly, tell you that God does not value women. It's ludicrous. Blew my mind. And I was just sitting there and I was just saying, hey, wait a second. Wait a second. Those little disciples, they've been in that village too. Right. Right? right. I never saw that. I'm 22 years in the faith. Never seen that. Oh my gosh, I just love it. Isn't he awesome? He just eats me little nuggets. <laughs> Amen, guys. Do you see you, this woman? Jesus wants to tell you. I see you. I see you. And El Roy is another great passage in the Old Testament. Hey, God, in the name of God. But God is who described him as the God who sees a woman. Yeah. A woman. And I think it was the first time it was even brought up that a woman, if any man or woman, named God. Wow. The first naming of God. Come on. I could be here all night. This is the Bible. I'll go and read it chapter by chapter and I will show you how much you love and value. Read it on. Come on. My last and final point. Jesus values women leadership. Jesus values women leadership. We want to read now in chapter 8, women's elevation section. <laughs> chapter 8, verse 1. After this, after he just told this wonderful woman to go in peace, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. It is good news. Yes. The twelve were with him and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, just in case you forgot. <laughs> Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. Okay. <clears throat> we have God values women's leadership. Come on, Sam. So here we see Jesus with his traveling company going from one town to the next doing what he does best, evangelizing, telling people about the good news. And the Bible here tells us that there were 12, the 12, i.e. the apostles, and also three incredible women. Come on. Three incredible women. Mary Magdalene, who, again, the Bible says, had seven demons. She was an amazing testimony. And I was laughing at ICC one Saturday then because I was like, can you imagine being the sister that they introduce right. you every Sunday? As, this is Michelle. She had seven demons. <laughs> She doesn't have them anymore. It's me. Yeah. I can tell you more about it after service. Oh, can we just move on? It was 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Let's move on. But no, it was profound. It was like amazing. God, the Bible was like, they've been demons, guys. Perfect. I mean, she was crazy. <laughs> she was bad. <laughs> okay. So you got this lady, and this is like the, the, the incredible diversity. You see, you, you know, we all sometimes look at each other and go, we are red tag, we are red tag. But check this out. You've got Mary Magdalene, now you've got Joanna in the way of Chisa, a very affluent and influential woman, up, up in the echelons of government. And then you have Susanna, which the Bible doesn't say much about this woman. But what it does say, it says that she was at the foot of the cross when Jesus died. Yeah. So she's a faithful woman. She not only financed Jesus' ministry, she was faithful to the end. 
And what's very, very, very powerful, another amazing thing about women and how God really wants women to get there and elevate it. Almost, I feel a little bit embarrassed that it's like so obvious about how much he loves us. I'm like, are we favored now? <laughs> this is actually this inner circle. So this inner circle of women are mentioned various times in the Gospels, these three. As Peter, Peter, James, and John are also mentioned, the, the three inner circle of the guys. And that's mentioned in Luke 9. So the first time, so in Luke 9, 28, he took Peter, John, and James, his three guys. These were his inner circle, his inner leaders, the leaders of leaders. These women were also leaders of leaders. Those three guys don't get named until a couple chapters down. So the women leaders get mentioned first. Wow. Isn't that awesome? Give another round of applause for God. <laughs> that is awesome. And what's even more incredible is that Mary is always mentioned first, as Peter is always mentioned first, which means that Mary was the leader of the women. She was the women's ministry leader of the women. So we see the biblical example that we are following in our church, that there are women leaders for the women's ministry. Yes. Amen? So women were vital because it says that these women were taking care and helping to support the ministry. Now, this word, were helping, which is in verse 3, that is actually from the Greek word deconio, which means to serve or literally to wait on tables. <coughs> so it's also from the, the root of where we get the word deacon. Yeah. So, these women, so really the leader is just a servant. These women are only financed out of their needs, uh, the ministry, but they also served, like waited on tables. So they made food, probably washed clothes at the river, I don't know where, you know, stuff like that. Uh, carried stuff, helped, helped with day-to-day -day stuff as well. So they were incredible women. And also it means to, uh, the original Greek, uh, the tents, you, the tents, used in the original Greek means that these women financed Jesus regularly and consistently. So they did it not just once, it was habitual. They were faithful partners on whom Jesus could rely. Sisters, God needs us. Can Jesus rely upon you financially? You know, we're having some special missions coming up. And it's every year. And sometimes twice a year, we can feel like, Ugh, it's biblical. We got to continue to use whatever we can to support and help out of our own means. That's how it works. Jesus didn't do it any other way. What's really incredible is God could have done it another way, right? God could do anything. God could have made Jesus born, allowed Jesus to be born into a wealthy family that could have financed his whole ministry. Or, like the Old Testament, right? They were in the desert. God brought down manna. He could have just given them manna every day. He said the Israelites are good enough for them. Good enough for you guys, right? He could have done a weekly or even a, every other day miracle of getting fish. Loads of fishes. He fed 5,000, he fed 3,000. He could have done that. But he didn't. Yeah. He used these women. <laughs> Again, they were vital. They were vital. God uses people, but most especially for us tonight, he uses women to support and help him. He Amen. relies on women. Amen. Can Jesus rely on you? Amen. And as I said, I'll just go and close out now and get some feedback, but it was probably quite unusual for Jesus to be traveling around with women in such close proximity. It probably raised a few eyebrows. His enemies, as we know, his persecutors were always, it says, they were always looking for ways to kill him or to persecute him or to defame him. They even regularly lied about him, accused him of being a glutton and a drunkard. Matthew eleven nineteen. 19. Because why? Because he hung out with drunks and people of bad reputation, but he loved people. He had no discrimination in his heart. What's so interesting is that there were never, there's not one accusation 
ever made on the basis of how Jesus or his apostles and disciples treated women. Right. They were never accused of treating women badly. Mm-hmm. Impropriety. What's that word? Impropriety, Tommy? Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Another way, it's an easier way. <laughs> <laughs> he never was accused. I think that's pretty remarkable. God is pure. God is pure. You can trust Jesus. And I think, too, this is due to the value that Jesus placed on women's leadership. Because he used these three women to be the leaders of the leaders, the, the leaders of women, they were able to do probably the most of the discipling for Jesus. So he didn't have to get in there all the time with all the women. And we see the same principle in Titus 2, right? Titus 2, verse 1 through 6. Titus, by Paul, was called to disciple the older men, the older women, and the young men, everyone in the church except who? The young women. Yeah, we've got some Bible girls in here. Yes. Who are they? Who are they to be decided by? The older women. Yes. And I think, you know, ministers can be deceived by thinking males, we got to protect their hearts and protect the sister's hearts because sometimes they think they're helping a sister, but it's creating emotional impurity sometimes. And it, and it's, it gets kind of weird. Yeah. So it's better for, uh, if you're a young sister, yeah. go to an older woman and let her help you. Or older yeah. sister, you have to be that old, but even older in the faith. Yeah. Just to guard your brother's heart. Now, I love, some sisters come to my husband and his dad, that's fine. But, but regularly, I'm doing the bulk share. Yeah. And especially when I'm talking about sexual abuse or anything sexual, Obviously, you got a woman to do that, to, to talk about those things. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, yes, uh, biblically, the women decide the women. Yeah. That's biblical. We see it here, we see it in the New Testament. Yeah. The letters to Paul, um, from Paul. Yeah. So, Jesus had an inner circle of women that would decide the women. Sisters, our leadership is vital yeah. in the church. And to also, not only vital in the church, but to protect the purity of the church. And surely Jesus values women's leadership. Can I get an amen? amen? So to close up, that's pretty much how I would refute people that tell me that God does not love women. To God be the glory. Thank mm-hmm. you.